Well, good morning to you. Let's turn in our Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 21. 2 Kings chapter 21. And this morning we want to look at the subject that I've given the title, The Ultimate Fool. The Ultimate Fool. And I believe this man, Amon, or Amon, sums up the character of a man who's the greatest fool of them all. Now, the last part of 2 Kings 21 deals with the dark chapter of the very short reign of this man, Amun. In fact, we're told he begins to become king at 22 years of age. And unlike his father, who reigns for 55 years, the longest of any of the kings of Judah or Israel, this man will reign one of the shortest reigns of just two years, 24 months is all he gets on the throne before God removes him from the throne. Now, he grew up in a home, if you remember, he's 22, and he lives to 24. His father, Manasseh, uh, was one of the most ungodly kings of Judah. But then in the latter parts of the life of Manasseh, the last 20 years or so, he sought to undo all the wickedness that he sowed into the first half of his reign as kings. And he was born really and grew up in a period where his father was seeking to walk with God, seeking to undo all the terrible things that he had done in the first half of his reign. Now, when his father died, doubtless there were many people uh, as he was growing up and after his father's death who were hoping, particularly maybe those around uh, this young man, Amun, that with a new king, a young king, who, who had never really plunged into sin in a very public way because of the influence of his father, that this young king could be influenced to loosen the restrictions, undo all the uh, new morality that his father had brought into the nation. Uh, maybe there were many from the old guard who had grown up and enjoyed the times of sinfulness under Manasseh uh, when, he was a very, when he was the prodigal king and then resented the restraints that he placed the nation under in the last half of his reign. And many of them no doubt were agitating to this man Ammon saying, well, now you're king, you're young, you're dad. We, we kind of understand why he did what he did because of the terrible situation of his imprisonment. But now it's time to loosen up. The people who will back you and stand with you, they want you to be less conservative than your father Manasseh. And, you know, the sad thing is that Manasseh left a good example and he left a bad example. And often with children, they love and admire their parents and they love to walk in the footsteps of their parents. But the sad thing is sometimes they walk in the wrong footsteps and sometimes they walk in the right footsteps. And it, it, there's no easy answer as to which one they will go. And in Manasseh's case, his son Ammon will choose to walk in the dark paths that he once walked. In fact, we're told in verse 20, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord as his father Manasseh did. So the paths that his father walked, he walked. And Verse 21 says, he walked in all the way that his father walked in, served the idols that his father served, and worshipped them, and forsook the Lord God of his father, and walked not in the way of the Lord. So, the very thing that his father did for the first half of his reign, this young man Ammon, he determined, I'm going to do that. I'm going to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And I'm going to let others do it. I'm going to be Mr. Tolerant, the new king, the new kid on the block. Now, if you turn to Second Chronicles chapter 33, there's an interesting little insight there I was reading earlier. It says in verse 21 of chapter 33, after he began to reign, it says, verse 22, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh, his father. But then it gives us a little further piece of information. It says, for Ammon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh his father had made and served them. So 
the evil that his father did, the seeds that he had sown, even the very idols he had made, became the idols of his son. Now, I think I mentioned a few weeks ago that one of the problems I had with Manasseh's repentance, or one of the things that I felt didn't go far enough, was that he removed the idols that he had set up, but he didn't destroy them. Now, later when Josiah becomes king, Josiah, he will not just remove, he will destroy. In other words, he's saying, these will never be used again to do evil. Whereas Manasseh just removed them. And maybe there's a little clue there that he was either afraid to destroy them, or maybe he was too superstitious to destroy them, or maybe even he thought, well, you never know, I might go back to them. Or he, he, he didn't have the courage just to completely wipe out all the evil that he had done in the past. And he thought, well, I'll do that down the road, but never came to the point that he was willing to do it. And the things that he left behind, those idols, were now grabbed by his son Ammon. No doubt others said to him, look, your father worshipped them. The idols are still there. You can worship them. If your dad did it, you could do it. And this boy Ammon, just 22 years of age, he took the very idols that his father should have destroyed, should have eradicated, and worshipped those idols. But there's something else very interesting in Second Chronicles chapter 33. Because here's where there's going to be drawn a great contrast by the Holy Spirit between Manasseh, his father, and this boy Ammon. Because if you remember, Manasseh sinned just like Ammon. They were born in the same period of time, roughly. They were contemporaries. Uh, they were both equally as involved in idolatry as one another. But when Manasseh was humbled by God, he then humbled himself and repented. Uh, but verse 23 of 2 Chronicles 33 marks a significant contrast. It says, and humbled not himself before the Lord, as Manasseh his father had humbled himself. But Ammon trespassed more and more. So there's an implication there. When Manasseh was judged by God and chastised by God, humbled by God, he then humbled himself and repented. Whereas Manas Ammon, by contrast, he sinned just like his father, but then when, his, when God began to rebuke, even chastise Ammon, Ammon refused to humble himself. And unlike his father, not only did he refuse to repent, but as he says, he be sinned more and more. He, it says, look, notice this again, and Ammon trespassed more and more. You get the idea here? Here's a young man. No matter what God does to him and says to him, it makes him even worse. Unlike Manasseh, when God really humbled Manasseh, Manasseh humbled himself and repented. But this young man, Ammon, he refused to humble himself. His heart was absolutely hard. It was like a Pharaoh's heart before the Lord. Now, what happens when sinners continuously harden their hearts to the chastisement to, to the rebuke, to the warnings of God. In the end, God has enough of those who sin with their eyes open, who know the truth and refuse to bend the knee to the truth. And verse 23 of 2 Chronicles 21 details how God had enough. Just two years into his reign. Remember, his dad reigned 55 years. Just two years into Ammon's reign, God says, enough is enough of this boy. And we're told, and the servants of Ammon conspired against him and slew the king in his own house, in his own palace, where he shook his fist at God. God says, I'm sick of you, Ammon. My patience has run out with you. And God allowed his servants, those who were supposed to be his protectors, his confidants, to rise up and assassinate this man. And now the kingdom of Judah has become like the kingdom of Israel. Because if you remember, 
the kingdom of Israel was plagued by assassinations and conspiracies and one dynasty replacing another. And here we have the exact same thing now happening. The same idolatry, the same refusal to repent, the, in fact, the uh, desire to sin even more when God warns and judges. And now we have the bloodshed and the assassination and the murder and the massacres going on down in the kingdom of Judah. And God often deals with sinners in such a way. If you keep resisting and resisting and resisting against the truth, there comes a point where just God says, enough is enough. Now, no doubt Ammon was a very selfish, ruthless individual. Had to be to behave in such a way. Had to be a very wicked individual. And no doubt his servants uh, felt that it was better for the kingdom to remove him, that he was a tyrannical individual. I'm sure he was all those things. But that didn't give them the right to murder him. And now the kingdom is on a knife edge. Will it become like the kingdom in Israel and sway into another murderous tyranny? Or will the nation swing back to God and have a leader who walks with God from the house of Israel. And we're told in verse 24 of 2 Kings 21, it says, And the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon. So the first hint that there's good news here is that the people, having had 57 years of Manasseh and then Ammon, of all this yo-yo religion, of all this yo-yo uh, believism, one day worshipping idols, the next day worshipping Jehovah, the people seem to have got sick of it and have a desire to come back to the Lord, have a desire to clean up the nation like it was under the days of King Hezekiah, the grandfather of Ammon and the father of Manasseh. And rather than let the murderers get away with it, they enact the death penalty as a very clear sign and symbol that their behavior in murdering the king is not acceptable and their way of death and destruction and sinful behavior is not going to be accepted. But then they do something else which is just as remarkable. It says in verse 24, the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon. Well, first, so, first step so good. Justice has been executed. But then God's will is now forwarded because we're told, and the people of the land made Josiah, Josiah his son king in his stead. Now chapter 22, verse one tells us Josiah is just eight years of age. So this is a big step. This is just a boy, eight years of age, primary school kid. And it'd be very easy for a military leader or another political rival to say, well, I'll take the throne as the regent and seize the power, become another Caesar, another dynasty like the ungodly nations do, like the Israelites up in the north do. But the people in Judah, not only did they execute justice on the murderers by putting them to death, all of them, but the second step also shows a hopeful sign that they take Josiah, the innocent boy, relatively speaking, one uncontaminated by the sins of Ammon, one that seems to have some promise, some hope, to walk with God, and one that honors God's covenant promise with the house of David. For God had promised, if you remember, there would not uh, lack in David a man to reign over his kingdom in the future. And the people honor that commitment uh, by taking Josiah and putting him on the throne, even though he's eight years of age. Uh, they're sending out a very clear signal. We want to have God's king reigning over this nation. Now, God didn't allow, and this is the mercy of God here, Judah to swing at this point into the same behavioral patterns as those in the north in the kingdom of Israel. And this young boy, Josiah, what a king he will turn out to be. His name even is hopeful. The name means whom Jehovah heals. And God really needed to heal this nation and have mercy on this nation. And Josiah is going to be the king uh, 
that will bring such healing, at least during his reign. Now, we're told in verse 25 of 2 Kings 21, the end of Ammon. It says, the rest of the acts of Ammon, which he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And he was buried in his sepulcher in the garden of Uzzah. And Josiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Now, he wasn't buried with the other kings, the, 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 the king's sepulchers. But he was buried in the same place as Manasseh, in this garden. We're not really sure exactly where it was in the garden of Uzzah. And if you remember, Manasseh was buried there in verse 18 of chapter 21. We're told he was buried in the garden of his own house in the garden of Uzzah. So he was buried in his own home. Now, why were they two, these two individuals not buried with the other kings like David and Solomon and the rest of the kings of Judah? Some think, well, maybe they were too full, those graves. Others think it's more likely because they were such blatant sinners that they didn't deserve to be buried with the godly kings of Judah. It's just hard to say. Now, we need to focus a little bit on Ammon this morning. Here's a young man, 22 years of age, who becomes king for just two years. And in those two years, he demonstrates to his people, and to the world, that he is a great fool. He's a young man that grew up in great privilege. He inherited a great kingdom from his father, Manasseh. But more than that, he inherited the knowledge that his father, Manasseh, had sinned and been greatly punished by God and humbled by God and was only restored to the throne and enjoyed a measure of success after he had repented and walked with God. So Ammon is a young man who sinned against God's knowledge, who sinned deliberately against God's knowledge. And that's why he's such a fool. You see, there are many people who are foolish in terms of their outward behavior. The man who drinks all his money in the, in the pubs, in the clubs, he's a fool. The man who takes all his money and gambles it, he's a fool. Uh, the man who destroys his marriage by running around with all different types of women, he or she that behaves that way is a fool. But the greatest act of folly is to know the truth, to be taught the truth, to experience the truth, and yet turn your back on the truth. The greatest fool is the one who knows how to go to heaven and yet chooses to go to hell. That's the ultimate fool. And this man, Ammon, is the ultimate fool. Now, never forget that he grew up in the home of a believer. And that's so true in the scriptures that growing up in the home of a believer does not make you immune from making foolish decisions. Look at the sons of Eli. Look at the sons even of Samuel, what a leader he was. Look at the greatest king of the nation of Israel and Judah, David. What a leader he was. What a spiritual leader he was in terms of his example, in how he taught the people, how he led them in worship in the uh, tabernacle, how he wrote the Psalms of his experiences with God. What, what a man he was, and yet what a terrible father he was. And what a flawed family he led. And it's a great example to us that spirituality does not go up and down the genetic line in the DNA. Ammon grew up in a home where his father was repentant. Never forget that. He was just 22. So in the father's 55 years, he was born and grew up in the better period. In the period where his father sought to do the right thing. So this young man, Ammon, sinned against knowledge, sinned with his eyes open. And as the curtain falls on his life and the life of Manasseh here in this chapter, you can't help but notice the contrast between the two men. Yes, they both sinned. They both sinned in the same way. They both worshiped the same idols. But, but, what a contrast between the father and the son in that the father humbled himself when God humbled him, whereas the son hardened his heart rather than humble himself 
when God humbled the Son. And in the final sense, in the ultimate sense, Ammon's murder was just the final act in a life of failure. And as his body lay there, no doubt the blood flowing from it in the palace, the corpse lying there, starting to rot. It was a metaphor, a symbol of his own rotten, decaying life, a life of rebellion and stubbornness against the Lord. And really it's a silent warning to us all as parents about our children, but as individuals about the dangers of taking advantage of God's grace and God's mercy and God's goodness and not harnessing those opportunities to walk with God. Remember what the Bible says? He that hardeneth his neck, lo often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. And that's exactly what happens, Ammon. God just comes in and cuts him off in his prime. Hadn't even made the age of 25. God just comes in and says, enough is enough. I've seen enough. I've had enough patience. This young man is going to be cut down and cast into hell. And his life ultimately was a failure. I was reading this week of a insight into the life of one of the famous authors in English, of contemporary English, a man called Jack Higgins. And Jack Higgins wrote a famous book, The Eagle Has Landed, indeed many famous books, which became war films. Jack Higgins, as a boy, sought to be famous, particularly sought to be famous by his writing. And he said at the end of his life, towards the end of his life, this, what lesson would you like to have known as a boy that you know now growing up as an adult and someone who's achieved a level of fame and success in your field? Notice what he said. He said this. He says, the lesson I would have liked to have learned is this, that when you get to the top of this world, there's nothing there. Wow, what a statement. Solomon discovered that centuries ago, millennia ago, when he said, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now, he's not talking about everything in this world is empty because if God's there, it's not empty in your life. But what he's saying is, without God, without God's presence, without God's salvation, without the power of God in your life, vanity of vanity. That's what life is, empty, empty, empty. And Jack Higgins said the very same thing when he looked at all his fame and success. He says, when you get to the top, you discover there's nothing there. There's nothing there. Turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. Because the Lord Jesus Christ gives us a very interesting little insight into people like Ammon and the judgment of God upon people like Ammon. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, it says, Then began Jesus, he, to abrade the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done. Now notice the word work there is in the plural. Works, plural, are done. Why does he scold and rebuke them? Because they repented not. And he begins to speak to a place called Chorazin. It's a beautiful little village, uh, some miles away from the Sea of Galilee, up there where Jesus spent a lot of his time and a lot of his ministry. He says, woe unto thee, Chorazin, woe unto thee, Bethesda. So two places, he said, I, I have spent a long time. I, I've done great miracles there, many miracles there. I preach many sermons there. I, I've spent significant portions of my public ministry there. He says, woe unto you, for if the mighty works, again, notice plural, which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre and Sidon is a, another region uh, further away, uh, a region in the, uh, where Jesus only, uh, we know, spent, went one time, met a woman, a, a, a Canaanite woman there, recorded in Matthew 15, verse 21 to 28. So Jesus says, woe is you. God's judgment, greater judgment is upon Chorazin and Bethesda. He says, because if the works had been done in Tyre and Sidon, that's two sinful places, uh, 
but yet places that I never really visited or rarely visited, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and in ashes. So he says, I have done so many wonderful things in Chorazin and Bethesda. And he says, whoa, God's judgment is upon you because you have sinned against greater light than those who live in Tyre and Sidon received. In fact, if they had received more light, more of them would have repented. But then he goes on to say in verse 22, something further. He says, but I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Wow. So here's another principle Christ states. The more light you receive, the more knowledge of God's truth you receive, the greater God's judgment will be upon you when you reject it. You wonder why Manasseh got 55 years to reign and this boy Ammon got two years. God says Ammon got even more knowledge, more insight, because he was able to see the dangers of sin from his father's life, uh, the dangers of not repenting early in his father's life. And he knew all that and he sinned against all that. He, he went and actually got the same idols his father had torn down. And he brought them back and worshipped them. And God says, it's going to be more dangerous, more painful, more severe on the day of judgment for Ammon than for someone who has sinned with less light, less knowledge of the truth, like the people in Tyre and Sidon. And then in verse 23, he says, And thou Capernaum, speaking of the region itself, where uh, Chorazin and uh, this other place, Bethesda was, he says, Thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven. So they were exalted in spiritually by having the presence of Christ there for so long, that whole region. He says, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So, let every religious person here take these words to heart. Take these words to heart of what Christ has said here. Light both saves, but it also condemns. The same light that melts the wax can harden the clay. Isn't that right? And if you're exposed to greater light than other people like Ammon was, and you continually reject it and reject it and reject it. You sin with your eyes open. Expect a greater judgment of God. And even in the day of judgment, where the sinners of Sodom and Gomorrah, who will deservedly be punished all of eternity, who will deservedly face the wrath of God, you will face a greater wrath, a greater punishment. Now, I don't know how God is going to allocate those levels of punishment in hell, but the Bible teaches he will. It's not that those in Sodom and Gomorrah will have a pleasant hell and those like Ammon will have an unpleasant hell. All will be unpleasant. But the worst punishment will be reserved for those like Ammon who have sinned against the truth. It is a great advantage to live under the sound of the gospel. It's a great example to come to meetings like this. It's a great example to hear preaching like this, to have the word of God in your own mother tongue like this and hear it proclaimed like this. It is a great privilege to go to churches with Sunday school and choirs and prayer meetings that are based on God's word. All those things are a great blessing, but they can become a great curse if you reject the truth that they're teaching you, that they're directing you to walk in God's way. Now, let me wrap up this message by saying a number of things this morning. Here's the first conclusion. Number one, notice this from the life of this man, Manasseh. God is a God who judges sin. <laughs> Make no mistake about that. God is a God who judges sin. The book of Habakkuk chapter one says, the Lord, thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil and canst not look on iniquity. Old Isaiah, he cried, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. God is a God of holiness. And not everyone will get to heaven. And hell is created for a reason. Because God is a God who judges sin. 
make no mistake about that. It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter what other people argue. The Bible teaches us black and white, Old Testament, New Testament, every book of the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, it teaches God is a God who judges sin. Number two, a lesson we want to learn this morning is this. God judges sin in his time and in his way. You know, Manasseh was a great sinner. So was Ammon. Isn't that true? Both father and son. But yet, Ammon, God only permitted two years to be king. Whereas God permitted Manasseh. 55 years. And there'll be some here who say, well, I thought God would at least give Ammon 25, 30, maybe half even of what his father got, 27 and a half years. But no. God doesn't owe anybody one year, indeed one minute, in our sins. And just because God permitted in grace 55 years to Ammon, or sorry, to Manasseh, it doesn't mean that God will give 55 years to you to continue on in your sin. And the two years that God gave Ammon were two years too many, were two years of grace, and yet he refused to repent. And just because you're young, you're healthy, or, or you're feeling, I've got many years left, or I've number of years left before I need to get right with God, it doesn't mean you'll get them. Ammon didn't get even five years. God cut him down suddenly, just two years, into his reign as king. But then the third lesson, the final lesson I want you to learn is this. God never loses control because of sin. Well, that's such a note of encouragement. As you read the story of Manasseh followed by Ammon. It'd be very easy to read such stories and say, well, things are just getting worse and worse and worse. And to even start to think, God's lost control here. The nation of Judah has become like the nation of Israel, like the Canaanites and the Amorites and the Philistines. They're living the same way. They're just as idolatrous. They're just as immoral. They're just as bloodthirsty and ruthless. They're murder and mayhem. And there's just no hope for anything. There's no hope for the world. Well, you could be, you could think that. You could even say that. But you'd be very wrong. If you remember in 1 Samuel, in the famous incident in 1 Samuel chapter 4, after the death of Eli and Hophni and Phinehas, the wife of Phinehas cried, Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed. And she called her son Ichabod because she says, God's glory has departed from Israel. It's over. The great nation, the holy nation, is finished. But she was so wrong. Because just as she was speaking, God had a plan and God had a man called Samuel who would lead the nation back to righteousness. And through Samuel, God would raise up and anoint Israel's greatest king, David. And through David, the greatest king of the nation of Israel would come the greatest of all, the greatest man who was ever born the greatest king of kings, the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't assume, because things are declining everywhere, that it's over with. Don't assume because there seems to be chaos from our perspective, that God has lost control, that God is confused, because nothing is further from the truth. And you know, even in this story of Manasseh, followed by Ammon, there's a great news coming around the corner. Because one of the greatest kings in the nation of Judah is about to come to the throne. A man called Josiah. And Josiah would do so much good in terms of his example, in terms of his influence, and his testimony. And it just is another reminder that 
God's work cannot be stopped. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ said this, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against. They, they won't, he said. They'll try, but ultimately they will fail. Ammons will come and go, but ultimately God's Josiahs will emerge. Old Mr. Wesley used to put it this way, God buries the workman, but never the worker. God's work will always go forward. Now, we have a little lesson from the story of Ammon for sinners. And it's really this, don't despise the grace of God today. When God speaks to you today, harden not your heart. Many years ago, at the turn of the 19th century, or the middle of the 19th century, born in 1850 in Scotland into a Presbyterian home, was an only child called Robert Lewis Stevenson. His father was a godly Christian man. And he discovered, as his son grew up, that his son was very, very talented, a precocious young man. And being an only child, his dad and mom were particularly attached to him. And his dad sought to teach him the word of God and poured in scripture after scripture, taught him the catechisms and the creeds of the church. And this young precocious talent was able to absorb all that knowledge and commit it to memory. But you know, Robert Louis Stevenson went off to university in Edinburgh. His parents prayed and sought God to protect their little boy. When he arrived at Edinburgh University, there was a number of people there who were great skeptics. And there were a number of influences there from uh, David Hume, Herbert Spencer, Spinoza, Charles Darwin, their writings and their teachings. And, and he drunk from that poisonous fountain until he came to a point where he said, I don't need God anymore in my life. And he formed a little club at Edinburgh University of like-minded skeptics. And they had a motto in the club. And listen to the, the motto that they passed as the motto of the club. Ignore everything that our parents taught us. What a terrible thing. On the night of January 30th, or the 30th of January, 1873, when he was just 23 years of age, Robert Louis Stevenson went back to his parents. And he gathered his mom and his dad and he said to them, I have something to tell you. I want to tell both of you, I no longer believe in God. I reject the Christian teachings of your faith. And I'm going to live my life my way. His parents were heartbroken. His father said to him, you have rendered my whole life a failure. His mother, weeping, said to him, this is the heaviest affliction that has ever befallen me. But Robert Louis Stevenson refused to listen. And he became a great writer, writing classical English works like Treasure Island. Robert Louis Stevenson went out on a path of wickedness. He pursued after a married woman persuaded her to leave her husband. And she was a woman of great wickedness who was mixed up in the occult and witchcraft. And the two of them got together and moved away from England and Scotland because they wanted to break free from all religious influences and went off to the South Sea Islands to a place called Samoa. There he lived the life of a millionaire with a vast estate, enjoying the fruit of his literary talents. But you know, at just 44 years of age, God had enough of Robert Louis Stevenson. And God struck him down with a brain hemorrhage. And he died in agony in the South Sea Islands. God said to him, enough is enough. Just like Ammon, cut off in his prime. And you know, before he died, he wrote these words. Words, He said, describing life, 
He said, life is a pilgrimage from nothing to nowhere. That was the empty life that he was living. He says, I'm just going on this journey from nothing to nowhere. That's my life. Empty. Empty. And he lived that way, and he died that way. But you see, there's an old song that we love to sing. And it says, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. It's a song of a prodigal. It's a song of the prodigal king Manasseh, really, who spent years in vanity and pride, caring not that his Savior was crucified for his sins, living for self. But you know, in one of those stanzas of that wonderful hymn, it says this, Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my soul found liberty, or there my burdened soul found liberty. Where? At Calvary. At Calvary. And you know, if you're listening to me today, and you're on the run from God, you've turned your back on God, you've decided you don't need God. You're going to live your life your way. You know what God's word says, but you've made a decision to go your own way. There's a lot of Ammon in all of us, isn't there? A lot of that spirit of rebelliousness. And I say this to you, come to the cross. In fact, I don't just say come to the cross, I say run to the cross. Listen to the words of the song again. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Religious person, run to the cross. Irreligious person, run to the cross. If you're a church member, run to the cross. If you're not a church member, run to the cross. If you think you're a good, you've lived a good life, run to the cross. If you're ashamed of your life, run to the cross. And you'll discover, as the hymn says, there your burdened soul will find liberty, will find peace will find forgiveness. Don't be like Ammon. Don't sin against the light. That's the ultimate fool. And that's the ultimate act of folly. May God help you to run to the cross today. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for this thy word, a very sobering word, but a word that is true, not just in the days of Ammon, but in, true in our day, that the only place of safety and peace and forgiveness is at the foot of the cross. We pray for the backslider. We pray for the prodigal. We pray for the rebellious sinner today. May they run to the cross, cry for forgiveness before it's too late. For these things we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen.